If I could travel back in time and sit down with my 22 year old self, you know, the eager software engineer with a full head of hair who thought working 80 hours a week would be able to get them promoted, would be able to get them successful. I know exactly what I would tell him. You're about to waste three years of your career making the same mistakes that 90% of all new developers make. And mistake three, that's the one that's gonna cost you a promotion that you deserved. By the end of this video, you'll know the five specific mistakes that are sabotaging your career right now, the warning signs that you're making them, and the exact steps I would take to avoid years of frustration and missed opportunities. But first, let me tell you about the day I realized everything I thought I knew about success and my career was completely wrong. It was like 2.15 p.m. on maybe like a Thursday when my manager, Sarah, at the time called me into her office. I've been working at the company for about 18 months. I was putting in longer hours than pretty much anybody on my team. I believed that my code was really clean, my features were shipping, and I never missed a deadline. I walked into her office and she told me that she cannot give me a raise or promotion and that to keep working hard and it'll happen maybe next year. So let's dive into some mistakes that brought me to that point. So mistake number one was waiting for someone else really to drive my career. This can also be known as like the passenger seat trap because you're like next to the driver. When I landed my first real engineering job, I thought I'd figured out the secret. I just switched from being a business analyst to a real backend developer. I was ready to prove myself. My strategy was simple. I wanted to work harder than everyone else. I wanted to write better code than everyone else. And I wanted people to notice that like I am just working so hard for this company. And if I just keep doing what I'm doing, people will notice. Hopefully someone will pull me aside and say, hey, Eric, you're working so hard. Here's your path to becoming a senior engineer. And that someone will steer me toward my next big opportunity. But you know what happened? That magical moment never came. Six months passed, 12 months passed, then 18 months passed. I watched other developers get promoted or maybe even assigned to more important projects, but I was never invited to those architecture meetings. Meanwhile, I was still waiting for someone to notice how my, excellent my code was and how hard my work ethic is. And this is what I didn't understand, that your career is 100% up to you. Managers have their own problems to solve. They're dealing with deadlines, budgets, and their own performance reviews. Companies focus on what they need right now, not always on where you should go in your career next. If you don't advocate for yourself, plan your own growth, and you know clearly ask what you want, no one's going to do that for you. The day after I decided to stop being a passenger in my own career, I scheduled a meeting with Sarah and came prepared with very specific questions at that time, like what skills do I need to develop to reach senior level? What projects should I work on to gain that experience? Who can I talk to or who can mentor me in areas that I'm weak in? And what does success in my role look like over the next six months? And for the first time in 18 months, Sarah had a real conversation with me about my future. She told me I needed to improve my communication skills, take ownership of project planning, and really try and start mentoring juniors and younger people on my team. And just like that, at least I had a plan. So here's your action plan to start today. You need to set clear career goals. Write down exactly where you want to be in six months, maybe a year, in two years, be specific, not just, I want to get promoted and make more money. Try and make it somewhat like measurable, like you want to be a leader in distributed systems at your company. You also want to schedule monthly career check-ins, not just rely on the annual reviews. Try and get your manager to be a part of your career growth. Try and get your manager part of your career path, not just having them advocate one time at the end of the year. Make sure you are the one that's in charge, right? And you can do this a couple different ways. You can do this by documenting your wins. Keep a running list of all your accomplishments, or you can also call them like a brag list. When promotion time comes, you have concrete evidence of your impact, but this is only like one step of a four-piece puzzle, right? And the second piece is like the second mistake I made, which was really more damaging, and it's why brilliant developers are often get passed on developer roles. And that second mistake is that you're trying to prove that you're the smartest person in the room, also known as the intelligence trap. In my early years, I was completely obsessed with proving how smart I was. I wanted to be the one finding the tricky bugs. I wanted to be the one that was writing the elegant solution. I wanted people to look at my code and be like, dang, this dude's really smart. And sure, being technically skilled really does help your career. But here's what I learned, right? And it's that intelligence alone will only take you so far in your career and in your path. 
I remember a critical project where we were building a payment processing system for like our entire e-commerce platform. The deadline was pretty tight. The the stakes were high, right? It's an e-commerce payment processing and everyone was very stressed. (laughs) I volunteered to lead the technical design because I was confident I could build the most sophisticated, scalable solution. So I spent like a weekend probably um, architecting a complex system with like multiple layers of abstraction. When I presented my design to the team, I immediately saw confusion on their faces. My solution was technically sound, but it was so complex at that time that like other developers couldn't easily understand like how to implement it or maintain it. Jake, who was my colleague, raised his hand and said, now this is really technically impressive, but I'm worried about debugging this in production and having our other developers work on it. He then followed up with, what if we started with something, you know, simpler? Something that the whole team can understand from the get-go. And Jake was right. His simpler approach got the team moving quicker. People understood it. They could contribute to it. And when bugs appeared, which they always do, the entire team can help fix them. And this is what I discovered about real leadership at that time. The engineers who got assigned to the most important projects weren't always the smartest in the room. They were the ones that people trusted. And trust comes from a few things, right? So trust comes from keeping your word. When you say you're going to deliver something by a specific date, make sure you deliver by that specific date. It also comes from communicating clearly, explaining complex ideas in the ways that like really anybody can understand. It's about how you make other people feel, creating an environment where people aren't afraid to ask questions or admit their mistakes. And it's about focusing on team success, caring more about the projects succeeding than about individual credit. You need to care about the people. Now, mistake three was caring too much about my title and not enough about the impact. Now, I'm going to call this the vanity metric trap. In my early career, I was obsessed with how I looked on paper. I cared about my title, my LinkedIn headline, the company logos on my resume, the technologies and all the buzzwords that I could throw on there instead of the actual work I was doing. I Truly remember spending time perfecting my LinkedIn profile, making sure I listed literally every framework or every little technology that I learned or heard of, threw it on there because I thought that if I could make myself look impressive enough, opportunities would start flowing in my way and literally no opportunities have ever came for me (laughs) through there. But here's something that I did learn. And it's simply that no one cares who you are on paper. They only care what you can actually do for them. About two years into my career, I was interviewing candidates for a junior developer position on my team. On paper, one candidate looked really, looked awesome. <laughs> it, a computer science degree from a prestigious university, internships at big tech. They had like a 3.8, so really impressive GPA, and their resume was full of all the buzzwords that everybody wants. But when we started actually talking about problems... He struggled. He couldn't explain really the past projects he was working on. He couldn't really walk through decision making that he has ever been a part of. He had memorized frameworks and patterns. But when I asked him about like how they can be applied, he didn't really know that either. And I left kind of confused. We also interviewed another lady. Her name was Sarah. Ironically, a different Sarah than my manager. No degree, no big name companies on her resume. But she has built some real projects. She had her own website. She built like a, a little e-commerce for a small company. And, you know, I was in the e-commerce world with the payment processing. And she did that during COVID. She built a Chrome extension that helped her grandmother's book club find books at the local library. And when we gave her a coding challenge, she didn't write like the absolute best algorithms, but the code worked and she could explain her thought process very clearly and asked questions. And then at the end, she even wrote some tests about her code, which was really impressive. And if you had to guess who we hired, we hired Sarah. She had real experience solving real problems. And that mattered way more than prestigious company names that I was originally chasing in the beginning. After that interview, I started asking myself different questions. So like, instead of how does this look on my resume? I asked, what problems does this actually solve? Instead of asking, will this make me sound impressive? I asked, will this help me build something people need? Six months later, I had a chance to put this new mindset to the test. Our company was struggling with a manual process that was eating up hours of customer support time every week. The impressive thing would have been to build some complex system with the latest technologies, something that I could add to my LinkedIn, add to my resume, something that I could be like, yeah, I worked with that technology. But instead, I built a simple automation script that took me like 
maybe a day to write. It wasn't sophisticated. It wasn't cutting edge. But I think it ended up saving that team like 15 hours a week, which meant they could now spend more time actually helping customers and focus on harder human problems. That simple script got me the recognition more than any other previous impressive work I've done at the company because it solved a real problem that actually mattered to the business. Now, mistake four is to only show up when the work is exciting. I'm calling this now the motivation trap. When you're starting out as a developer, motivation comes easily. Every project feels new and exciting. You're learning constantly. Every bug you fix kind of feels like a victory. Every feature you ship feels like you're changing the world or your situation. Remember my first few months as a backend developer? I couldn't wait to work every morning, I was building APIs, I was making some CRUD apps, I was learning about databases and solving problems I've never seen before. I felt like I was like leveling up every single day and that's really exciting. But then something happened that I wasn't prepared for. The work became more routine. About a year into that specific role at the time, I hit what I call the developer wall. The projects weren't nearly as exciting anymore. I was doing a lot more maintenance work, fixing bugs in old code, updating dependencies, optimizing queries that were running slowly. Nothing that was like truly exciting. It wasn't glamorous work. It wasn't the kind of stuff I could talk about, you know, exciting, like, you know, being excited about it at like meetups or with my wife. It was just necessary. And I'll be honest, I started not caring as much. I spent my energy on the fun projects and did the bare minimum on pretty much everything else. I procrastinate on like code reviews and boring features. Sometimes I'd even try and rush through bug fixes so I can get back to the important work, which is just more fun projects. I thought this was normal. I thought everyone was kind of doing the same thing about maintenance work, like maintenance work is below me. Then I started noticing something that real developers who were getting promoted around me were doing. They weren't the ones always necessarily working on the flashiest new projects. They were the ones who showed up consistently, even when the work was boring. Jake, yes, the same Jake from before, was a perfect example. While I was avoiding tedious bug fixes, Jake was diving deep in them. He wasn't just fixing the immediate problem. He was understanding deeply why that problem existed in the first place to really understand the business to why that was even, you know, a possible that there was a bug even there. That's when I realized something really important. And that's that great software engineers is built on just showing up consistently, especially when the work is not exciting. Motivation is temporary, but consistency creates compound growth. It's easy to be great for a sprint when you're like really excited or brand new on a project, but it's much more challenging and it's much more harder but much more valuable to be solid and dependable over months and years. The boring work teaches you things that the exciting work just like can't, like how to understand and modify complex legacy code, how to debug systems you didn't work with before, how to work within constraints and deadlines that you didn't set, how to maintain quality even though you didn't like personally set up the design. All of this comes from working on, you know, boring tasks that just showing up every single day can help create. So instead of dreading it, I tried to change my mindset that boring tasks are just as good as greenfield projects. And you know what? We had a legacy reporting system that was slow, fragile, and universally hated by the team. Instead of just fixing the immediate issues, I tried to really like kind of own that product and understand it as a whole. And then later on, that project needed to be completely innovated and we were going to create a brand new greenfield project for that legacy application when i was asked to move on to that project it was super cool so i started off with like trying to learn the legacy and then i was asked to work on the modernization of that project so i was able to get kind of the greenfield but i also knew the business and i was only asked that because i knew exactly how that system worked because i spent the extra time diving in so how you can also embrace the grind is find learning in every task that you do so even bug fixes that teach you about the system architecture user behavior and edge cases document everything turn routine work into knowledge that benefits the whole team you can also look for patterns use boring tasks to understand the larger systems problems so that you can improve it And lastly, you will always want to measure impact, right? So track your consistency and see how you increase velocity for the entire team. And now, lastly, mistake number five is do not be threatened by colleagues that are smarter than you. Instead, just learn from them. I call this the imposter syndrome trap. This is the mistake that took me the longest to recognize. 
and it probably took me the longest to fix. And it's probably the one that held me back in my career the most. And that was throughout my first years as a developer, I constantly felt pretty insecure when I worked with engineers who I thought were smarter than me. I'd sit in with meetings with senior developers and think, do I even like belong here? When someone would suggest a different approach to a problem I was working on, my first instinct wasn't even curiosity, like let me learn, it was more defensiveness. When a more experienced engineer would refactor my code during a review, I would take it personally, like get out of here. I wanted to keep my this variable the same instead of treating it as an opportunity to get better. I was treating smarter colleagues as threats to my career instead of accelerators and you know people I can talk to for growth. So about two years in my career, I was assigned to someone who I consider is a, a true 10x engineer. We can call him Marcus for the story, but he had about 15 years of experience and has helped work on multiple successful startups. My first instinct was really just to try and keep up with him. To, and that was my way of like trying to prove that I belonged on the same team and like spark like some little bit of competition. But I learned very fast, do not try and keep up with a 10Xer if you're not a 10Xer because they are way better than you. <laughs> and the main reason was I just didn't want to seem inexperienced. It was exhausting trying to keep up with him. And I'm glad that I didn't because after a frustrating week, Marcus actually came up and pulled me to the side. And I'll never forget like the response when he asked me like what was going on was I stressed and I told him I just wanted to keep up with him you know I I figured I was probably annoying because I was less experienced Marcus laughed and not in like a mean way but in genuine surprise and he said are you kidding me you're actually better than me at explaining technical solutions to non-technical stakeholders I'm better at the dev stuff you're better at the talking stuff truly that was one of my motivations to start sharing online creating my LinkedIn creating courses being doing this YouTube what I realized then was working along alongside people who are better than you is not a threat to your career it's the fastest possible accelerator for your growth think about it logically Every question you ask saves you hours of research of tr and trial and error. Every code review you get teaches you patterns and potentially like best practices. Every pair programming session shows you new approaches and new techniques that you didn't know before. And literally, Marcus, I had him in an architecture discussion and he was able to help me rethink high level thinking on like how you can structure stuff. So just think of them as accelerators in your career. Because the worst thing that can happen is someone says, I don't know, or let's figure it out together when you ask a question. So always make sure that you try to not be the smartest person on the team. And I know that's such a common phrase, but for some reason in the technical world, we, we kind of, you know, fight or flight, and we really need to be able to push that behind us. Once you have a mentor, pay it forward. And as you gain experience, mentor new developers the way others mentored you because that's like the long-term impact, right? The long-term impact for me was Marcus and I still work together regularly. He's helped me navigate m multiple career transitions. He recommended me for speaking opportunities and he's connected me to like many amazing other developers. That relationship, which started with me feeling threatened, ended up being one of the most valuable professional relationships of my career. And it only happened because I learned to see smarter colleagues as teachers instead of competition. So here's what I wish someone told my 22 year old self on the first day as a developer. You don't get ahead by being the smartest person in the room. You get ahead by making others around you more successful. You don't get promoted by having perfect code. You get promoted by solving problems that matter to the business and communicating your impacts clearly. You also don't build a great career by avoiding difficult conversations or challenges or projects. You build a meaningful career by taking ownership of your own growth and consistently showing up, especially when it's hard. Remember, your technical skills got you hired, but your professional skills will determine how far you go. Keep building, keep learning, and keep growing, and I will see you in the next video.